Thank you, and welcome to this wide area. Very wide, but I think I will handle anyway. Okay, thank you for coming and listening to us. Uh, this is a report from a project we, had, uh, we have had uh, for the uh, last 10 months, uh, which goes about scrubbing uh, test logs or test, test, test results, which is a big problem for us. So uh, we'll go, go through that and see how we have handled that. This presentation is in three parts. First, I will do some motivation about how we, how we come to do this and uh, the reasons for it. And then uh, Thomas here, he will, uh, he will do a, an online uh, demonstration of how this is actually can be done live with no cheating. And at last, we have Carl here. He's from uh, Certus, which is our, uh, which is, uh, uh, which we are doing a lot of cooperation with in, in Cisco for uh, when it comes to uh, testing stuff and uh, software validation. So he's a PhD student. So PhD student would be nice to him. He will tell us about uh, why this is very dangerous to do, or why uh, I mean, give us some rec recommendations. So <clears throat> first. Uh, First, we start with the, uh, the reasons for doing, it, doing this. Well, what's the big deal here? Uh, everything starts out with uh, continuous integration. We are doing a lot of testing at Cisco. We have a huge co code base, lots of people working on it, maybe over, over 100 check-ins every day. And all of this has to be tested. So it's lots of testing all the time. Um, and need, because we need to do a lot of testing, we get fast feedback, and we get fast feedback, we get uh, faster development. So it's a lot of good things by testing a lot. So typically, you, the developer commits the code, it to be built, it to be tested, and the report is coming back. And this cycle here is uh, for, for the first gate we have is uh, could be down to ten minutes, and that with real system testing. So. <coughs> The situation here is a little not that funny, really. Uh, the truth is we have 20,000 tests, system tests uh, running every day, integration tests running on real stuff. It's real, we are doing a video conference system, so it's, we're talking about real calls with a real system, with real audio, with real video, and a real network and everything. So it's a pretty big lab we have to be able to do this. Um, but unfortunately, since we are running on real stuff, it's actually, there are some percentage failing. On a good day, it might be 3%. On a bad day, well, it might be 5 or 6 or 7. It depends on what's going on. So, um, well, if you can, uh, can do the math, 3 to 5% on uh, 20,000 is still a lot of work. So uh, that means we have several hundred tests that we have to take a look at. So uh, I think I'll just go on further here. Uh, so the problem here is uh, we want to find the unknown stuff, the new stuff that's coming in. Uh, that's kind of, kind of hard. It's easier to find the stuff we, we, knew, we already know, know, know about and handle the rest as new and unknown. So it's quite obvious, but it's just to make state, it clear here that that's what we're looking for here is things we already know about. So we skip doing things we, don't, we have seen before. So analyzing test failures is a yeah it's a big job and it's become bigger and bigger as uh, as long as uh, we are adding more tests all the time and checking in more code. So the standard pattern is of course uh, writing some uh, regular expressions and scan all the logs that are coming in and detect that oh here you have a pattern that matches this bug, this type of problem and so on. We'll be doing that with quite success. So we have a system for that, and also we have automatic crash detection. That means that if a system, uh, our system crashes, it will send a report and we will uh, analyze it and uh, categorize the, the, the bug. So, uh, but the problem is there's still lots of uh, manual inspection needed here. We have lots of many, uh, lots of unscrubbed bugs uh, or un, 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 unscrubbed runs lying around, and that's not uh, that, that's not a good thing because then there is the danger of losing stuff or uh, getting uh, things are slip, slip, slipping through for uh, too too long time and uh, letting problems uh, into the customers. So, <clears throat> so the goal here is actually reduce manual inspection. 
not that uh, vendor's passion is that uh, is uh, not a good thing to do. But we have to do it. But we, what is not funny to do is to uh, to take to take a look at the same problem all over again. That's boring stuff. And uh, in fact, you don't get people uh, to do that work or skilled people to uh, to do that work over and over again. We have tried that; it didn't work out. So we need to uh, figure out another way to do it. So. Um, it would be great if we could spend time with just known things, or unknown things, things that brings us something new. So that's what we set out to do. So just to give an example here. This is a lot of test, test results we're coming in. As I said, we have 20,000 of these coming in every day. So, uh, some of them are passing, some are failing. The positive ones, we, well, we don't care so much about them. If we have lots of spare time, we can maybe go in and take, take a look at them if they are really passing. But the truth is that uh, they are typically put into the box of pass tests. But still, there are uh, lots of failed tests here, many hundreds. And um, they are failing in different ways. So uh, it's not enough with, with, with the metadata on the test that's pass and fail. Failed is a much more interesting thing. So we have different failures. So in this case here, we have five different uh, five different failures. This is, for example, for, for one test, uh, typical test. And it's not that uh, it could happen to have five different failures at the, at the same time. So uh, two of them is uh, red here, or, or, or yellow, and uh, six are black. And we could just categorize them and put them into some buckets. So uh, it would be nice to do it, do it like this, to take them away, we know about them, get them, get them out, of, out, out of the way. But there are more, so uh, when we're done analyzing our, our test logs, we'll we end up with uh, uh, lots of buckets. So, but the interesting one here is uh, the things we don't know about. That's the unknown problem to the left. The other ones we, have, we know about, because we have analyzed, them, analyzed that group before, and uh, we know it's that kind of problem. So, the job is boiled down to is, uh, inspect one instance of the unknown problem bu bucket. So if you analyze that one, you're done. That reduces the work a lot. So, um, you might ask here why, uh, why, uh, why we are running so many failed tests again, or all over again. Would it be good to just to stop testing when it's failing? Well, we don't see it that way. Uh, you know, if you stop testing, you have to know when to start it again, and uh, that's that's a job as well. And if you stop, uh, and uh, also on other things, some tests are wobbly or flaky tests, as we call them. They, uh, they fail now and then, and also that's most uh, the most interesting bugs are those kinds of bugs that are uh, not steady red or steady green. You know, so. Uh, so we like to keep them going, unless they are too uh, resource expensive, of course. So, uh, but the solution here to do, to, to do this is to use the logs, test logs to group into similar runs. So uh, the idea was to uh, extract the features from, uh, from the logs and use machine learning uh, techniques to, to group them to, uh, together and so that we can classify them to, uh, together. The assumption here is that uh, that this uh, must hold, of course. That we have, if you're grouping things together, they are, they are the same. So uh, that depends on, uh, of course, uh, if you have no signs of failure in your logs. You know, if the past logs and the failed log looks the same, well, then you're stuck. So, but, but that's usually not the case. So the savings here is uh, you can. It's, an, it's enough to just check one instance of each group, make, make sure that that's true, and you have uh, identified those those problems. That means either fix it, or uh, report a bug, or you know, uh, run it again, or uh, yeah, get told of people to fix it. So uh, the unknown problems, we just expect inspect one, one of them, or uh, probably you will do a, a few more to make sure that the grouping is working. So about the test logs, because that's a, a clue here. Um, I've looked at tons of test logs in my life. I guess most of you have as well. 
But they're typically, they are typically readable. It's, uh, you know, they have a start and a stop and uh, some middle where things are failing or passing or well, things. But there are some interesting things there. Um, they have some uh, runtime uh, uh, words coming in there, like timestamps. It could be hashes, it could be IP addresses, it could be uh, whatever, test na uh, system names, and so on. And also the sequence might vary a little bit. So especially with doing system testing, you know, timings might be, might be different. So you cannot, you cannot do diff on logs. It doesn't work. So that's uh, what we wanted to, uh, to figure out how to do. And um, now it's time to, uh, for Thomas here to uh, try to uh, do a little demonstration here. It's not exactly how, how we do it, but it's sim very similar. Thanks. Good evening. Uh, I'll now run through a small uh, or a brief demonstration of uh, sort of trying to illustrate. Yeah. Trying to illustrate. Hmm. Trying to illustrate sort of or to give you an idea of uh, what we've been doing. Uh, and also to illustrate to you uh, sort of the, the low threshold that exists currently for getting started with doing machine learning stuff. So, um, the, what I will be showing you today is uh, me using uh, a Python library called uh, scikit-learn, which is a machine learning library, and uh, I'll be coding in a tool called Jupyter Notebook. Which, um, so, have any of you heard of uh, Jupyter Notebook? Yeah, some. It's a, as far as I, uh, <clears throat> my knowledge, it's really a really great tool to do iterative machine learning stuff. Um, and as you'll hopefully get a feel of uh, how, uh, and hopefully uh, at the end of um, the demonstration, you'll get a feel of how. Uh, how easy it is to use uh, the scikit, uh, uh, scikit library, as well as how fun it is to work in the Jupyter Notebook. So I'll just open my uh, Jupyter Notebook session. Uh, Jupyter Notebook runs in your um, browser, or it runs as a server, and you open it in your browser. So you enter uh, Python code snippets into these uh, cells, now, uh, this is my first cell. Uh, I've added some code. It's not really that interesting. It's essentially just me importing stuff from the scikit library that I need for this demonstration, as well as some utility functions that I'll use later on. So, uh, returning to the problem posed by Marius, essentially we want to take, uh, or essentially what we want to do is extract uh, more information from our logs than the metadata provides. Uh, so, the steps I'll go through is essentially taking our raw text logs, uh, doing some pre-processing on them, converting them into a format that you can apply machine learning to, as well as applying a machine learning algorithm and sort of illustrating the output of that algorithm. So, uh, the first thing we need to do is to get our logs. I've prepared a small data set to illustrate the first portion of uh, uh, my talk. Hopefully that is correct. Yeah, so it's a small data set of five logs. Um, now, Beginning with machine learning, you, the first thing you want to do have, is have an idea of what exactly the data you're, you're working with is all about, and what's contained in your data. So we'll have a look at the first log, or one of the logs. So here you can see it's a contrived uh, test example. 
um, containing like typical things you find in, uh, yeah, you know, uh, test logs. It's uh, timestamps, the debug info level, as well as the uh, debugger name and the output of the debugger. So <clears throat> since our task is to look at similarities between logs, the timestamp is an issue since it's essentially something that, at least in our scenario, it will differ every single time you run the test, meaning that uh, you get it acts as a noise element for the machine learning algorithms that we're going to apply later. So uh, one thing you can do in order to improve your results uh, is to remove those elements from your logs. So we'll do that quite quickly uh, using a re simple regular expression. Mm. Oops, I forgot. I want to apply it to all the lines, not just the first. No. So there you go. So now we've just removed the noisy elements. Now it's a good practice, I think, to keep a token that represents the elements that you removed because um, just removing the elements essentially means, or potentially means, uh, that you're actually just removing information. But keeping the token, you'll retain at least some of the information. You'll, uh, for, for example, in this case, uh, probably a better name for this uh, token is uh, timestamp or something. So essentially, it's, uh, um, it, acts, uh, it has two purposes. One is to retain the information that there is a timestamp there, but it will be the same across all logs. And also, um, for debugging purposes, because mostly, most likely if you're working, creating regular expression, sanitizing your input, you'll uh, uh, at some point have multiple uh, regular expressions, and it's a nice thing to know which regex is causing uh, uh, your output to be strange or uh, malformed. So one, now you have a, hopefully you have an idea of like uh, one thing you could do to, to improve your uh, uh, take your raw input and improve upon it a bit and reduce noise. Uh, so now uh, the next logical step is to convert your raw text data into a, a, a vector format uh, which contains numerical values that sort of represent the signature of your text file. So here comes our uh, scikit-learn library. Um, Scikit-learn provides uh, several methods you can use for this, but uh, we'll use um, a method called count vectorizer. Essentially, it can take um, our, uh, our list of logs and um, what it will do is that it'll... Oh, it'll output uh, the, the vector sequence after it's applied a vector, vectorization scheme on our raw logs. So since I'm, uh, I'm just using the default scheme, which is take all the words of all the logs, uh, and then for each log, create a vector containing columns representing those words, uh, and the value of those columns will be the number of occurrences of those words in that log. So to illustrate uh, further, I'll uh, show you the output of one of the logs. So here you can see the signature generated by the count vectorizer. It's just each element is a word and the number is the number of words in that log. Uh, another thing you can, uh, uh, another interesting thing to further highlight what count vectorizer is doing is that the vectorizer keeps track of all the um, words that it finds across all logs, it call, which uh, it refers to as features. So as you can see, um, these are all the words 
across all the, the uh, five logs. Uh, now, <clears throat> since I'm using the raw logs, uh, I'm getting these uh, time stamps as words. And these are, uh, as I hinted at earlier, these are essentially noise because the algorithms will apply later. We'll, we'll see these as, well, probably you'll have one word that is very unique for each log and the algorithms will usually say, oh, that looks very interesting and assign it more importance than uh, the other words that are the words we are really interested in. So, if we do, if we instead apply all uh, the, the previous step, the tokenization step to all our logs, uh, this is just a utility function that does that before uh, I send the logs into the vectorizer. You'll see that we end up not with those numbers, but with the token instead. So, um, using just words is probably the simplest type of uh, uh, creating those signatures. And using only words uh, actually al also takes away some of the information embedded in the logs. For example, the word ordering, like which words follow other words. So, uh, perhaps a logical next step would be to uh, use or a way to extract more information from our logs would be to combine, uh, um, to use combinations of words instead of just single words. So in machine learning, this is uh, referred to as n-grams. I'll just instruct uh, the, oh, I'm doing it in the, in the wrong place. So I'll just instruct the vectorizer to use uh, pairs of words instead. Uh, yes. So now you can see it, the features it extracts is now just word pairs. Uh, yeah, and essentially you can create, uh, with the vectorizer you can create more words or combination of word pairs and word triplets or whatever you want. You have to experiment to find out what suits uh, your needs the best. Yeah, so now hopefully you have an idea of how you convert your text logs into signatures, um, or at least some of the ways you can create signatures from your logs. Uh, now I'll move on to um, uh, using uh, a more uh, realistic dataset, uh, which is taken from our test environment. It's also a bit more, uh, there's a lot more data. So it's also a bit more interesting to look at uh, the output. Um, yeah, the, the <coughs> let's just take, we'll run the, the new log set through the account vectorizer. As you'll see, we'll get a lot more features because it's a more realistic data set. Yeah. Um, so what I want to do next is to, in order for you to have a more uh, intuitive uh, understanding of uh, uh, the data and how exactly we are comparing them and uh, sort of saying that they are similar is to plot the, the, the vectorized data. Now, <clears throat> as you might see, our uh, uh, question is that we have 891 features, which is essentially 891 columns, which is uh, 891 dimensions. So uh, you can't really plot that directly. So for, for the purpose of this talk, we're just applying uh, uh, an, a lossy algorithm that uh, projects our vectorized data down to two planes. So um, we'll just uh, use my utility function here and take our vector sequence and plot it. Yeah, there you go. So 
does anyone, it's uh, clear to everyone? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so you see each dot on this plot is a log, and probably you have some intuition already about which logs are similar and uh, which logs maybe should be placed together inside a single group or uh, as related to our prob problem, like category or specific problem. Um, but essentially, like what we're trying to what we're trying to solve is that you shouldn't be you, you shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be looking at logs at all. So now we'll apply uh, one of many possible clustering algorithms. And <clears throat> this clustering algorithm outputs, based on the, the, the log vectors, it outputs a new uh, array with, of numbers where each element is a log and the number um, of the element is the group assigned to that log by the uh, algorithm. So a negative one are uh, logs that are not assigned to any group. So we return to our, uh, uh, our plot again, and now we use the new information that we uh, um, uh, got from our algorithm and use it to colorize our, um, uh, our data points. And we want to use a full range of colors. Yeah, so here we go. Now we have a plot combining our uh, uh, vectors as well as our, uh, uh, the output of our clustering algorithm. Um, as you can see, the negative ones are colored in red, so they're uh, not in any group. You see, <coughs> we have groups here, here, and here, and it looks rather sane. So, <coughs> uh, at this point, we have a functioning machine learning pipeline, which you can experiment with. Uh, it's a bit uh, simplified, perhaps, but uh, it's uh, this is all it takes go to go from raw text logs to something that you can at least p play around with and see exactly like w w how much information you can extract from your data. So the. Um, Probably after this, you'll uh, want to experiment a bit with the input parameters of your of the different 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 classes I just used. Um, so, for example, say that it's your opinion that uh, these uh, this cluster should not be two different clusters, and you'll just you'll quickly find the input parameter for this clustering uh, algorithm. Uh, and you can adjust it, increasing the size of the, the groups. And you can play around with this uh, almost infinitely if you, if you want. It can be a lot of fun seeing how uh, changing stuff in the pipeline uh, uh, changes the output. So uh, now, uh, Carl, uh, Carl Martin is going to tell you a little bit about why you should probably sp spend not too much time doing that. Hello, does the microphone work? Yeah. Great, excellent. So now that uh, Marius has introduced you to, uh, to the general problem we're trying to solve, and Thomas has shown you how easy it is to get started with, with modern Python, Python to do this kind of data science, I want to take a step back and reflect a bit more broadly and give you some, some recommendations that we've, uh, based on the experience we've had so far, if you want to start out with a similar project. So. Let's look at the clustering that uh, Thomas's Jupyter Notebook uh, resulted in. Um, now, 
uh, as humans, uh, we can look at an image like that and immediately see patterns and then sort of assess, well, how, how well does the coloring, the suggested coloring map onto our intuitive idea of a clustering, right? Uh, but uh, but it's, it's a bit unclear if we can trust our intuitions here. I mean, we have, we've told you very little about the actual data we're clustering, and, it's, and even though we can kind of define, give mathematical notions for what a good clustering is, for example, saying that in a good clustering, the points within the cluster are close together, but the points who are in separate clusters are far from each other. It's, it's not clear how this relates back to our data. So if this was a, a, a idealized or standard machine learning task, the, the, or the first type of machine learning task that you're likely to encounter if you take a machine learning course, uh, the dream would be that we already had a data, where, had some data, where for each data point, we already knew which error it corresponded to. And then we would take that data set, we would split it into a training set and a test set, and we would use first the training set to build a classifier that would internalize some statistical, internal statistical representation that could be used to, uh, to classify new incoming data. And then we would, uh, we would take the other part of our data set and we would test it and make sure that, this, that the system actually has, uh, is, is accurate in how it classifies the errors. But in our problem, we, we can't really do that. So we could uh, take a lot of historical data and sit down and tediously label all of it, but uh, apart from being prohibitively cost uh, uh, or cost intensive, uh, it would uh, it would quickly expire because the, uh, we are testing systems that are evolving continuously, and the definition of an error will uh, or new errors will occur all the time, and uh, and exactly the, def the the definition of an old error might change. So what we are left with is what's called an unsupervised learning problem. So where we are forced to create a machine learning system by generalizing from the internal structure of the data without any knowledge of any ground truth. So if there's no ground truth here, uh, can we even do anything here? Uh, well, it's pretty important then that you need to develop some kind of safety net, right? If you're starting out with a project like this. And the kind of safety net I'm talking about uh, has both a human dimension and a technical dimension, right? So, on the human dimension, it's clear that all the systems we're developing are solving some kind of human problem, right? With human stakeholders. And uh, even if it, maybe it's your boss, maybe it's your uh, customer, uh, it's at any rate very important to clarify expectations about what this system can and cannot do. I mean, I'm sure uh, you all see uh, the newest uh, Gartner hype cycle report. Um, this is basically a yearly report that tracks technology trends uh, to see um, uh, what are up and coming trends and what's currently at the top of the hype. So guess what's at the very, very peak? Deep learning and machine learning, right? So every day you're bombarded with articles about the, about the wonders of machine learning. But the, 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 the hard reality is that creating good systems that leverage these techniques is not easy. And it's very easy to overpromise to stakeholders what the system can do. So be very careful about expectations, especially when it comes to expectations about risk. So uh, I know that many of you here work on embedded, very, very safety critical systems. And if you're trying to apply machine learning to a problem where a misclassification is fatal, then you simply can't do it. You have to be very, you have to ask yourself some hard questions about, okay, what's, what's the consequence of a mislabeling, right? And if that consequence is prohibitively high, you have to look at uh, other places. But if you have problems where, uh, if it works most of the time, it's okay, then, then that's the kind of problem you should, you should use machine learning for. Uh, so make sure before you start out that everyone's on the same page, everyone agrees on what this can and cannot do, and that everyone's properly informed. But, so that's kind of the human part, right? But then there's also technical things you can do to kind of build yourself a safety net even though you don't have a ground truth. And uh, I want to give you an example that we could apply to the problem that we just sh sh uh, showed you. So we found that after applying the tokenization step that, that, Marius, uh, that Thomas demonstrated where we took all the runtime specific information in the tests and removed them, we found that many of the tests actually get identical uh, shasms. Like if you, 
uh, like many, many logs that were uh, uh, that are, are, are identical. Like you take their shasm and they have the same shasm. So one very reasonable assumption then, right, uh, is that if our clustering is good, at least all the things that are, all the documents that have the, the same SHA should be, put, should be put in the same cluster, right? Now that's obviously not a sufficient condition, right? But it's, it's a kind of necessary condition that your clustering should satisfy, right? So if you can identify necess necessary conditions like these and incorporate them into tests, you can gradually grow a safety net that will help you sanity check uh, different solutions. Because it's all code after all, right? So all of you here are experienced engineers, you know about testing, you know about best practices. And like the previous speaker here also said, uh, machine learning systems are also software systems. So just bring in all that experience you already have and, 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 and don't throw it out the window when you, when you approach a machine learning project. Speaking of code, let's go back to the code that Thomas demonstrated. Uh, it's pretty cool, I think, that you can, uh, you can express the entire pipeline in one slide, right? So decades of machine learning research is now available to everyone uh, at their fingertips at, at very convenient, high-level abstract, uh, abstract libraries. And this is great. But uh, with these very convenient uh, libraries, it's very tempting to treat it all as a black box, right? That is just, as long as it works, uh, I don't have to dig, dig deeper into, what that ha into what's going on behind the scenes. The problem is, if you're doing unsupervised learning, you have no choice but to really, or if you, uh, I think you will, find, you will find yourself in situations where you have to crack open this black box. Uh, so let's, uh, because this code hides a lot of complexity. Uh, I mean, if we just look at the count vectorizer function that, uh, that Thomas demonstrated, and we look at the documentation, there's a lot of parameters going on here. I mean, just, just count vectorizer takes seven categorical parameters, three numeric parameters, two parameters accepting any iterable, one par parameter accepting a numeric range, and four parameters accepting any callable. And if we look at the, at the clustering algorithm we're applying, and we look at the documentation for that, there's even more. So one can be, one can be a bit intimidating when one, starts, when one starts to open this black box, as if it's impossible for a, a practitioner or layman to understand what's going on. But don't worry too much, because uh, all, the, all these things, uh, uh, all these parameters have same defaults if you understand the intended use case. Right? So, so usually there will be an intended use case for uh, where the, the data is assumed to be of a certain shape and so on. And if you understand that use case, then the, para the, rest of the parameters fall into place. And don't be afraid to, and the tutorials are actually really, really nice. They have very relatable uh, relatable examples and ample of pointers to help you dig deeper if you really need to understand what's going on. So, uh, so uh, open the black box, uh, black box but uh, uh, start by identifying the intended use case and then you'll, you'll get pretty far. And lastly, remember to measure, discuss and iterate. Uh, so consider Netflix, for example. They're in a great situation when it comes to machine learning because they have very precise metrics about the overall goal of their system, right? So the more, you, the more time you and I sink into TV shows, the, the more money Netflix is making, right? So any machine learning system that optimizes that goal is helping them succeed. So maybe you have similar high-level metrics for the problem you're trying to solve. And if you can identify those and quantify them, then you have an additional precise safety net to help you test and verify your system. Similarly, uh, I know most of you come from very uh, from, um, from sophisticated technological organizations with lots of experienced personnel. So get everyone on board and, 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 uh, and ask uh, and discuss your problem with your colleagues and try to get a competing perspective on what you're trying to do. Flip the problem around and so forth and be prepared to iterate a lot. Because when you're doing unsupervised learning and you're, you're learning machine learning while you're learning the problem you're trying to solve and so on, it's gonna be a lot of trial and error. So don't expect to get it right on the first go. Uh, so to summarize some of, the, some of our, our recommendations, clarify expectations with stakeholders and, uh, and everyone, write tests, because it's code after all, uh, crack open the black boxes and measure, discuss, and iterate. Because uh, to, to try to end on a positive note here, uh, you're all experienced engineers. You've all done testing. You've all built working software systems. 
and just remember to just bring that into uh, uh, into the machine learning adventure and remember to do machine learning, machine learning like the great engineer you are not like the great machine learning expert you aren't so thank you <laughs>